Good morning. Man, it's so great to see so many people here this morning. Well, let me just say welcome to you. And uh, for those of you joining us online, welcome to you as well. Uh, Given this new spike in COVID cases, we recognize that there's probably a lot of you that don't feel comfortable coming. Um, And we are just so glad that we have the ability to uh, be together while being apart um, through streaming. So uh, we are just so thankful for that and and want to welcome you to the service and also uh, just tell you that we can't for you to be back um, and for us to be able to celebrate together and worship together all as a family, all under one roof. Um, I would like to say a very special welcome to anyone that might be a, best, a guest this morning with us. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. And I have one uh, thing I'd like you uh, to ask you to do, and I'm not going to embarrass you or anything like that. Um, I just want you to fill out a Connect card for us. Uh, they are located at the and uh, in the back, on the back wall above the offering box. If you just fill it out for us and drop it in the offering box, that's all we're asking you to do. Uh, we would just love to be able to connect with you later this week and know that you you were here with us. Um, for those of you online, I'm going to talk to you for one more second. If if you're a member with us, we'd love for you to go on. Hop on the Church Center app and check in on the streaming service. That way we know that you're here with us as well. And if you're uh, first time uh, joining us online, we would love for you to go to our website and fill out the Connect card on our website. Um, and we, would, we just want to be able to follow up with you as well if, if it's your first time joining us online. Before we jump in, uh, please join us in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious day that you've given us, and thank you for the rain. I don't think any of us were expecting. Thank you for the ability to gather together and worship in your holy name. Your your name is holy and wonderful and worthy of all praise. I ask that you would guide today's message, that your spirit would invade our hearts this morning and would soften them with to the words we need to hear this morning. Lord, give me clarity of mind as I bring this morning's message. Lord, we want to know you better. We want to grow closer to you this morning. So we ask all these things in your precious name and holy name. Amen. Well, it's been a busy weekend. And uh, if you didn't know by Kurt's shirt, um, we celebrated Independence Day this weekend. Um, I wish I wish you'd let me know. I might have, you know, coordinated with you. And, uh, <laughs> um, I imagine it has been a busy weekend for most uh, everybody here and those online. Uh, this weekend, obviously, we celebrated our country's Independence Day. And what a great thing that is, right? That's a great thing. We're able to believe what we want, say what we want, do what we want, go, what we, go where we want, mostly... Maybe not due to COVID. <laughs> uh, but eventually things will get back to normal and people will be able to travel again and we'll be able to go about our business with little to no restriction. We live in a very blessed nation. While it is a day to celebrate our country's independence, most people spend it barbecuing or swimming or going to the lake, hanging out with friends and family, and of course fireworks. Did anybody go see fireworks this weekend? Yeah, where'd you go? Rockwall, was it good? All right, cool. Anybody else? Where'd you go? Our backyard. Our backyard, there we go. <laughs> Live out of the country, it's great. Uh, well, Kelly and I took the kids to Midlothian. Waxahachie uh, um, uh, canceled their fireworks, so we went over to Midlothian on Friday night, and, and they were great. A little bit worried that night when we were driving there. We were were a little bit behind, and but I I figured I'd found a a spot that we'd gone to a couple years ago that I was like maybe people haven't figured it out yet. But it was a a a spot where you go and it like a clear field. They they did their fireworks out of the high school stadium, a clear field that you could see the stadium, not too far, uh, so you could still hear the boom, but not too close that it's terrifying to the children. 
Um, and luckily, nobody, uh, there was very few people there. So when we got there, it was great, sat out. It was really fun. Um, and it was the first year, I think, the kids really enjoyed the fireworks. They were running around. So it was good. If you don't know, we've got three kids, five, three, and uh, 18 months, and one on the way. So um, it, was, it was a great time that, uh, on Friday. But this weekend, July 4th, isn't about getting to do barbecues and going to the lake or hanging out with friends and family. It's not even about fireworks. Don't get me wrong. I do love all of these things. Obviously, we participated in many of them. We barbecued last night and uh, fireworks, and I didn't get the opportunity to go swimming. I love swimming. I was talking to Kelly. I was like, man, that was one of the things I wish I'd been able to do yesterday with the kids. But we got to play outside in the water, and uh, that was fun. Fourth of July is about something bigger in the USA. It's a day that we remember that we declared our independence from Britain. The day that we said, enough is enough, we're done, we're tired of this injustice, this mistreatment, this taxes without representation, we think we can do better. Now before you think that this sermon is going to be about politics or America, or America it's not going to, even though, uh, you know, I'm wearing red and blue and the pastor wore a flag shirt. It's not, that's not what today's sermon's about. Um, however, the reason why I bring it up is as I was preparing today's message, I couldn't help but find some similarities and some parallels. And I thought it was really funny that I'm, I'm preaching on Nehemiah 10 today, uh, and it just so correlates with our Independence Day. So you're going to have to bear with me for a minute. Like I said, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 10 today, continuing with our God-sized series. And I'll give you a moment to pull it up, pull out your Bibles and find Nehemiah 10, or open your phones up and scroll to Nehemiah 10. And uh, while you're turning there, I want to refresh you on where we just were. The Jews had just heard the law read to them for the first time in probably 160 years. And their response was to confess and worship the Lord God Almighty. In fact, if you were here last week, we had a very unusual service last week. Something that we've never done before. And it actually mirrored what we saw in Nehemiah 9. As we're working through Nehemiah, we were in Nehemiah 9 yesterday, or sorry, last week. (laughs) Um we mirrored uh, the service to what we saw in Nehemiah 9. So we, we spent some time reading scripture. The elders led us through a time of confession. And then we ended with a time of worship during which we shared communion. We picked up, we, so we pick up here. We pick up here at the end of this time of the reading. Confessing and worshiping. So if, if you jump back one verse with me to chapter 9, verse 38, it's going to do a lot, of, a lot to help us kind of set the stage for this morning. It says, Now because of all this, we are making an, arra- or, or an agreement in writing. And on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. So then it goes on to list the names of all their leaders, with Nehemiah being the first. And this is very important. For the next 27 verses, it it lists all their names. And it shows us, through this making of a new covenant, it shows us the proper response to what just happened in the previous chapter. What the proper response was to reading, confessing, and worshiping. The proper response to hearing God's word read aloud, the proper response to spending time in confession. They prayed nationally, corporately, individually, and then they spent time together in worship, worshiping him, God. And it moved the people of Israel to make a covenant with them, with God just as it should in our own lives. But we heard so many times over the last week 
Pastor Kurt and I, how powerful of a service it was last week. And if you, if you didn't get to catch it last week, I would highly suggest going back and watching it. There was no message brought by a pastor. There was reading of scripture. There was a time spent before the Lord on our knees, being open and honest with him, sometimes confessing some really hard truths. We spent time confessing things nationally, as a church universally, the family, things we screwed up in schools, things we screwed up individually. We spent time confessing things as a church, as Stillwater. And then we moved into worshiping him and thanking him for the hope that we have in his son, Jesus Christ, by taking communion together. The hope that we can, that we can and are saved through the work that he did on, on the cross. And the fact that he rose again on the third day and is alive and preparing a place for us. So as we read through chapter 10, the only proper response to a time like what we saw in chapter 9 is that of moving toward God. In chapter 10, we see what moving towards God is. We get a glimpse of that, what that response looks like. We're getting a glimpse of what it looks like to take ownership of your faith, of, of what it looked like to take ownership, Israel, for Israel to take ownership of their faith. Israel was so moved that they made a covenant with God. They took ownership back over their faith after 160 years. And it starts, it says, starting in verse 28, now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a, a curse and an oath to walk in God's law which was given through Moses, God's servant, and to, and to keep and observe all the commandments of God our Lord and his ordinances and his statutes. Now, so I want to I want to focus for a second when he says that they were all together they were taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. What so what is what is what does it look like to take ownership of your faith? So we talked about 4th of July. We celebrate 4th of July not because our independence was won that day, but the 4th is the day that we declared ourselves independent. We did so through a document called the Declaration of Independence. This is going to pop up here on the screen behind me. 56 people signed their names on a document. You'll notice at the bottom, those signatures. Have you ever wondered what happened to those 56 people? Those 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence, what fates befell them for daring to put their names on that document? Well, five signers were captured by the British and tortured and and killed as traitors. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost sons serving in the war. Another two had sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died during the war. Seventeen of them lost everything they owned. They stood tall, unwavering, and they pledged for the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So what you, you may be asking, all right, what does this have to do with taking ownership of my faith? Well, verse 29, this is where it comes in. Verse 29 points out that the signers of the covenant and the people of Israel, by taking the ownership of their faith, they took on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. 
As the signers of the Declaration of Independence declared independence from Britain with a piece of paper, the Israelites declared their dependence on God with a piece of paper. When you make the right and proper response and move toward God and begin that first step into taking ownership of your faith, you accept some obligations of the faith. You take upon yourself a, both a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. As we walk through the obligations that I'm going to lay out here for, we will talk about that. So today, I, I want to point out three obligations that we find ourselves under when we take ownership of our faith. These three, I think, are pointed out to us in Nehemiah 10. The first obligation is to the authority of Scripture. I know this is a tough for some, but I'd like to look at, it, look at some key verses that talk about the authority of Scripture. And I'd like to set the stage a little bit in saying that the idea of the authority of Scripture and the authority of God We've struggled with this from the very beginning. All the way back to creation and the fall. What caused us to fall? We wanted to be like God. We thought we knew better. We wanted to be like God. So as, as we look at these things and, and look at the authority of Scripture, I want to, you to realize that from the very beginning, this is something that we've struggled with. Jesus says, beginning in, in, in Matthew 5, 17 through 19, do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets, or the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we see here that Christ didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And as well, well as Christians, we don't live under the law the law still has a purpose. That purpose has never changed. The purpose of the law is to show us what it means to be holy, what it means to be righteous. God is saying, this is the standard. And it's a mirror that shows us that we can never be holy. We can never meet that standard. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says, Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, and that the person dedicated to God may be capable and equipped for every good work. The authority of scripture is unchanging. As this verse says, it's useful for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. The problem comes in is when we decide that we don't like something. Or we can't fully understand why God's law was written, would be written that way, so we begin to bend it to our own understanding instead of God's perfect understanding. In fact, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 11 tells us that this is not a new struggle, obviously, it's not, I talked about it, we, we've been struggling it since Genesis. Since the beginning of time, we've been struggling with this. But First Peter, again, talks about, it says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who predicted the grace that would come to you searched and investigated carefully. They probed into what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified beforehand 
hand about the sufferings appointed for Christ and his subsequent glory. This shows us that the prophets didn't even understand some of the things that God was saying. They probed, they searched, they investigated. There are a lot of times we just can't comprehend something that we find in Scripture. I'm sure I'm not the only one that has ever read a passage of Scripture and come alongside and be like, wow, that was really convicting. Because in my heart, I feel differently. But who's wrong in that situation? I am. God's ways and his, God's ways are perfect. And, and it's a journey for each of us to discover God's ways and how his ways are better than our ways. And even though they might not make sense to us. So when you take ownership of your faith, you need to be grounded in the authority of Scripture. As it says, we are to follow God's law. To walk in God's law. The second obligation that we find in Nehemiah 10 is that we're to follow his commands. This one might seem a little bit straightforward to you. But let me assure you, it's not. And the reason why it's not is because we mess it up so much. Can I get an amen on that? Nehemiah 10, 29 tells us that Israel made a covenant to keep and to observe all the commandments of God our Lord and his ordinance and his statues, statutes. Sounds pretty familiar, right? You might have heard it in Matthew 28, 20. Under the new covenant, the second part of the great commission, Jesus tells them, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. Still pretty relevant, right? And yet we mess it up all the time. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've messed it up like five times this morning. I'm sure if you ask Kelly, she could probably think of three or four times I messed it up last week <laughs> with her and the kids. What's crazy is God even simplifies it for us. Jesus even simplifies it when he's asked this question, what is the greatest commandment? To love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. He wraps the entire law up into two things, two commandments. We can't even get those right. Two things. If you're sitting in the, in the chair today, here or online, if you're, if you're sitting on your couch, and you're thinking to yourself, nah, I'm good, that doesn't apply to me. You definitely follow his commandments. You definitely love God. I want to point you to Mark 10, 17 through 27, in the story of the young, rich young ruler. He comes up and he says, good teacher, how can I get eternal life? And Jesus turns to him and he says, why do you call me good? Only one is good, and that's God. And then Jesus kind of sets him up here. And he says, if you want eternal life, you need to follow the commandments. And the guy falls for it. He goes, why well, do that? I'm good. Me too. Jesus just said God was the only one that's good. This guy's over here going, me too. So if you're sitting in that chair today, and you're saying, nope, I'm good. You're that rich young ruler saying, me too, I'm good. If you're sitting there in your chair or on your couch and you're striving to be the best possible person, 
that you think you can earn your place into heaven if you're just good enough, if I do enough good to outweigh the bad, I'm a good person, I'm a certain profession, and that gets me in. I sacrificed over here, so that gets me in. If you're sitting there striving to do your best to be a perfect person, I need to be really honest with you and tell you that you're not going to make it. We talked about on on Thursday, if you watch the pastor Q&A, about Sabbath rest. And there's a spiritual side of Sabbath rest and, and finding rest in ceasing to strive. So Sabbath means to cease. There's a spiritual side of the Sabbath of ceasing our striving. And God is calling us to cease our striving. And the reason why we can cease our striving is because grace has been given to us through Jesus Christ. And that's what makes the gospel such good news. Because the law is over here telling us this is what righteousness looks like. This is what holiness looks like. And we can never attain that. But Jesus came down. He humbled himself, became man, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose three days later, and is alive Through his work on the cross, we are saved. He has taken all sin on himself. So that when we look at the law and we say, we can't make it, it's okay because Jesus can. He did. We don't have to strive. So if you're sitting in this room and you're saying, I just need to be a good person, I want, to he- I want you to hear this. You don't, you don't need to strive for that. Jesus has already accomplished that work. Now, I want to be clear because obviously, the second point, the second obligation that I'm saying is that we're supposed to follow his commandments, right? Well, Paul has an answer when, when this question is asked. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, it says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And he answers it, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who are rescued by the blood of Jesus Christ still live in sin? So we're to, we're, we are to obey and strive to obey his commandments. Because he calls us to be perfect as he is perfect. But understanding that our striving has nothing to do with our gaining salvation. It's only the work of Christ. As we move on in in Nehemiah 10, we run across the the third obligation, and that's to support his mission. We've talked about this for a few weeks and danced around it and seen it a few times, and we're going to continue to see it. We're going to talk today a little bit, if you'll give me a little bit of time, about, we're going to talk about money. I don't know, that's... Churches don't like to talk about money. Churches, in fact, a lot of churches 
they don't pass the plate. They don't pass baskets, you know, still water. We have a box in the back. You know, we don't want to make people feel uncomfortable about talking about money. We're not a church that gets up here and asks for money and talks about asking, you know, we're not a church that preaches about money every week. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. In fact, 2,300 verses in the Bible are about money. 15% of what Jesus is recorded saying is about money. 11 out of the 39 parables that Jesus says are about money. In fact, we see this all the way if going back to Genesis 4. Man, things start early for us, don't they? Going all the way back to Genesis 4, Cain and Abel, they bring their sacrifices to God. Abel's is good, Cain's is not. We have struggled to be a part of supporting his mission. So I want to read in Nehemiah 10 what it says here. Starting in verse 31. Well, there we go. Sorry. As for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or the holy day. And we will forgo the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also place ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. For the showbread for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things, for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. Likewise, we class lots for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites and the people so that they may bring it into the house of our God according to our father's household at fixed times annually, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. And that they might bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of the Lord annually. And bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, as it is written in the law for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God. We will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the new wine, the oil to the priests at the chambers of the house of our God and the tithe of our ground to the Levites. For the Levites are the, they who receive the tithes in all the rural towns. The priest, the son of, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, the new wine, the oil to the chambers. There are utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers and the singers. Thus we will not neglect the house of our God. The reason I wanted to talk to you about money today and supporting his mission is not to try and get your money. It's not the purpose. In fact, I want to have the same purpose that Jesus had in Matthew 6, 24, when he said, you cannot serve both God and money. What is he saying there? He's saying when he talks about money, when we talk about money, We want to bring it to a heart issue. 
And he recognizes that money is something that we hold so tightly to. It becomes a God to us, an idol. It's so funny that we were like that because we don't even realize that everything is God's anyway. That we're merely stewards. So if this makes you uncomfortable, if me up here saying that you need to be supporting his mission, if you're taking ownership of your faith and that means supporting his mission with your time and your resources, if that makes you uncomfortable, you need to look at your heart and ask, who is my God? I just want to recap here. When we say, when I say take ownership of your faith, we talked about the obligation of recognizing and respecting the authority of Scripture, obeying His commandments, sharing in the mission. And if you, if you leave here today, I, w- I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to declare your dependence on God and take ownership of your faith. And if you've already, if you haven't declared, if you, ha- if, let's say you're sitting here or online and, and you don't know Jesus, you're on the fence The only right move is to move toward Jesus. If you've declared and you're saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, but you're sitting here and you are not serving in the church, you need to be serving. You need to be sharing in his mission. If you're sitting in the chair or online and you're not in community, you're not in a community that of Bible-believing followers, brothers and sisters who can know you and speak into your life, you need to participate in his mission and be in community. And I'm going to challenge you. If you're not giving or you've never given to a church, look into your heart and ask why. I'm more than happy to have a conversation offline with you. I'm sure Pastor Kurt would too. If you have questions about our budget or anything. But I would encourage you to take that step of faith and be a participant. Share in his mission. Now, if you're already engaged, if you're, if you're giving, if you're serving, if you're part of community, awesome. You can always do better. We say reach, teach, and multiply. You're at a great place to start multiplying, to start discipling, to help somebody else grow in their faith. So take ownership of your faith today. Take ownership of your faith today. Be dependent on Jesus. Sign at the bottom line just as the Israelites did and declare your dependence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would impress upon the hearts in here 
and online the things that you need us to hear today. I pray that we would take ownership of our faith and begin living it out. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.